In this video, I'll go over David Rubenstein's How to Invest, where he interviews 23 of the world's greatest investors. I had the chance to go back and talk about their backgrounds with them, what made them tick, what it is that makes somebody a great investor versus an average investor. I'll focus on my three favorites. Stanley Druckenmiller, when he and George Soros broke the Bank of England and made a billion dollars back in 1992. John Paulson, who bet against the housing market and made $20 billion in 2008. And finally, Jim Simons, who doesn't wear socks, but has the highest sustained returns of all time from his medallion fund, turning $1 into $521 over a period of time when the S&P 500 turned $1 into about $21. So let's get right into it. In 1988, George Soros hired Stan Druckenmiller to run the Quantum Fund. The Quantum Fund is a macro fund, which means that it trades on macroeconomic world events like changing for currencies, wars, oil embargoes, things like that. This is unlike a traditional hedge fund, which trades on microeconomic events related to companies like increasing market share, increasing earnings or declining earnings, M&A. It's a very different kind of a fund. People say that Druckenmiller forced the Bank of England to devalue the pound on September 16th, 1992, a day now known in Britain as Black. Wednesday. But that's not what happened according to Druckenmiller. Druckenmiller explains that back in 1990, the UK government tied the pound to the German mark. To tie one country's currency to another, both countries need to have similar fiscal, that is taxing and spending, and monetary, that is interest rate policies. After 1989, after the Berlin Wall fell, the German economy was booming. It was booming because West Germany was investing to bring East Germany up to West German standards. In England, there was no similar boom, but because the two countries had linked their currencies together and linked their government spending and their interest rates together, this was pushing up the value of the pound and making it harder for the UK to compete internationally. UK exporters were being priced out of the market. Druckenmiller saw all this and explained it to Soros. Soros then said, we've got to put 200% of our money into this trade. And Druckenmiller explains that Icon, Soros, Warren Buffett, all the great investors, when they feel that they're gonna be right, they go big, they don't diversify. If you are swinging for the fences, going big can make sense, but for every icon, Druckenmiller and Soros and, and Buffett, there's thousands or tens of thousands of people who thought they were right, went big and went broke. This is a book how they did it, not how you should do it. Anyway, back to the story. They go big into the trade and sure enough, at some point, the Bank of England does have to decouple and they make a mint. This makes it look like Druckenmiller and Soros were sort of just bystanders, but everyone says they broke the Bank of England and I, I looked it up and Druckenmiller says none of this, but this happened and that uh, Soros, a famous investor at the time, really talked his book and he talked down the pound. He said the pound had to fall. He was very publicly attacking the pound and um, you know, he won. They did break the pound. They did make their billion dollars. The chart's very clear. It was one of the greatest trades of all time. The next investor that I really enjoyed is John Paulson. Paulson made a $20 billion profit for his firm and $4 billion for himself by shorting the housing market. It was the biggest of the big shorts. And one of the things I don't understand really, but I kind of understand is why Paulson is not in Michael Lewis's movie and book, The Big Short. And I think, spoiler alert, the answer is he didn't suffer enough. He's a classic Wall Street guy. And there's really no drama in his story. Maybe Michael Lewis could have found the drama, but to hear Paulson tell it, it was really quite simple. But what's interesting about the way Paulson did it is he explains shorting credit was very difficult at the time. We're all familiar with people who short equities. They short stocks. It's easy to short stocks, Paulson says, because First of all, if you want to short a stock, you can very easily borrow it from an index fund who will make a fee for lending you the stock and they use that fee to lower their costs. And it's really a beautiful example of how markets do work well. You know, the long-term investor gets lower costs and the people who want to short can go short easily. Very different in the credit market. In the credit market, credit securities bonds don't trade very often. It's hard to actually borrow credit securities to short them. And also the value of stocks always fluctuates. Whereas a credit security, it's very binary. Either the credit security will default and go to zero, or it will be paid in full when it matures. Investment grade rated credit securities up until 2008 had never defaulted, and you'd only profit if they actually defaulted. What John Paulson did was he had a hedge fund managing about $7 billion, and he was making about 10% a year, and he took 1% of his returns, about $120 million, to borrow credit securities and short them, that if they defaulted in that year and went to zero, 
he would have $12 billion. So it was like a 100 to 1 payout. And he explains that's why he did the deal. The risk reward was very favorable. Unlike, say, the crypto market, he explains, where he believes crypto is a bubble, but it's so volatile that you can't really short it. You could easily be wiped out by some enormous bull run in the crypto market. And that explains you know, how thoughtful Paulson really had to be to pull off this trade. Lastly, we have Jim Simons, math genius. He's won many prizes. The Medallion Fund has returns of over 40% for over 40 years, which would have turned $1 into $521 over a period of time when the S&P turned $1 into $21. Still great, still unlikely to be repeated, but nothing like what Simons accomplished. When Simons started trading, he had investors, but he quickly realized that to trade the way he wanted to, he had to keep his fund relatively small. So he kicked out his investors and only traded his employees and his own money pretty much from almost the beginning. Simons was always gifted at math and his initial specialty was called minimal surfaces of higher dimensional things. You know what that is, you're way ahead of me. You know, I, I and I think many other people like to think, pretend if you will, that we're pretty smart. But any kind of contact with people like Jim Simons really puts the rest to that quite quickly. And I think the most interesting thing about Simons personally is that as smart as he was, he was able to recruit and work with people, he says, who are way smarter than him. And I think the only lesson that's really applicable from Simons for us math normies is don't be afraid of smart people, embrace them, work with them if you can. It worked for Jim Simons. So Rubenstein asked Simons how he did it. And to me, it's a lot like asking someone like Michael Phelps how he did it. You know, he swam a lot. And that's not really useful advice for most of us. Simon says he used mathematics, common sense, and some good luck. So what Simons does is he says he finds anomalies in the market. He finds some sort of short-term aberration in the prices that he can then use his capital to exploit. Generally speaking, these anomalies disappear. Uh, if there's too much capital applied, they disappear too quickly and you know it's unsuccessful. If you understand math and you have 500 friends who also understand math at PhD plus levels, maybe you could give this a try yourself. Jim Simon's returns were extraordinary. He never had a down year. He didn't even consider himself an investor in that he never thought about a company. You know, he's a purely quantitative investor, simply understanding, using math somehow to understand how trading patterns can create predictable opportunities that he was able to exploit. I think he He's perhaps the only person to do this.